the table. And then they become one with the table. Last time we already covered the Jewish trials of Jesus. Oh, okay. I'm doing it on here. Picture. The um, Jewish trials were all middle of the night, except for the last one, which was first thing in the morning, none of which was legal. There are really two trials at which the Sanhedrin is present, at least some of the Sanhedrin. But to do official business, they have to be in official session. So the next morning after the sun rises, that would be the conclusion of the Jewish trials, where they condemn him for blasphemy and are ready to send him on to the Romans. So the leading Jews have their demands. Yes. So could they just send whoever they want to the Romans for them to kill? No, they had to have a case. Okay, so it was like, okay, I, the reason I asked that is just like they said that, you're know, like, and they sent them over to the Romans. It was like Romans were executioners, which they were, but like, you know, just... Like, did they just execute because they wanted to? Or did they, was they was it like the Jews? The Romans like, did. Can you punish this person because we found them guilty? Like, I didn't know if it was that No, way. you have to go to court and prove it. So Jesus is a pawn between two powers, both of whom believe they control Jerusalem and Judea. So the Jewish accusers take him to Pilate in his praetorium. He is a praetor, so his complex is the praetorium. And this had to be, for everything to happen, this had to be you know, before opening hours, early in the morning. And what they claim, and if you'll notice when you go back over these notes, I've done my best to combine all the accounts into a, a chronological narrative. And what they tell Pilate is that Jesus is subverting their nation. In particular, that he opposes Caesar's taxes and that he says that he's a and he says he, and they say that he claims to be a king. As you notice, this has nothing to do with blasphemy, which is what they accused him of by their standards. These are offenses that would offend Rome. These are challenges to Roman power. They are also distortions of the truth. When Pilate says, oh, that all sounds like something you should handle according to your law, they say, but we do not have the authority to pronounce the death sentence. Only Romans do, and that's why we want you to do it. John gives this striking conversation between Pilate and Jesus. Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus says, are you asking for yourself or because somebody told you to? He says, it's your own people, it's your own priest who accuse you. What have you done? And it is then that Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world or my people would fight. He's both addressing the most important spiritual truth and answering the charges that he is someone causing riots. So you are a king. You said it. I was born to be king and to testify to the truth. And then famously, not looking for any answers, Pilate says, what is truth? Pilate finds him not guilty. Why don't you answer my questions? It's just amazing that Jesus would. When he lets the Jews know that he doesn't find anything wrong with Jesus, they say, This man has made trouble stirring up crowds from Galilee all the way to Judea. And Pilate sees an out. Oh, he's a Galilean? Just so happens the Galilean tetrarch, Herod Antipas, is in Jerusalem for the Passover. We'll send him to Herod. Herod can try him instead of me. Sorry. Uh, I didn't know that would come up. Um, so... It's a mockery. It's not a trial. It's not even an interrogation. 
we're reminded that Herod wanted to see Jesus do a miracle. So he brings him in to question him and Jesus knowing how there's no point to it, doesn't bother to answer. Well, the Jewish leaders are all saying how terrible he is. But all Herod does is along with his soldiers, humiliates Jesus. He will find him not guilty. They ridicule him, make fun of him like he was a king, but they don't believe it. And they strip his clothes off of him, put a royal robe on him to send him back to Pilate. And in a height of irony, it says, as you know, Pilate wants to release Jesus. So he says, I'm just going to punish him. And he announces, neither King Herod nor I have found anything that this man has done that's worthy of death. I'll just punish him and release him. I did some reading in the last couple of days, and there seemed to have been different levels of flogging. Not all of them were meant to kill. And it seems that Pilate may have been just suggesting one of the lesser forms at this point. And then he attempts again to release Jesus, and we're told he knew that the priest had delivered him out of envy. It says a lot about what was going on there. It's a power play. He's got more followers than they do. And it's obvious to a pagan that that's what's going on. You know the story that traditionally they release a political prisoner every Passover. And so he says, I'll give them a choice that it'll be that you, they'll choose Jesus. So he puts up the king of the Jews, or Barabbas, who is an insurrectionist murderer. You know, the crowd didn't do it on their own. It says that the chief priests stirred up the crowd to demand Barabbas, and so they do. And so Pilate says, what should I do with Jesus? And the crowd says, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate still say, no. He said, for what? He doesn't deserve death. I'm going to punish him and release him. The crowd says, crucify him, crucify him. Before the ultimate punishment, he is humiliated. He says he should be scourged. There is debate as to whether there were two scourgings or whether this was simply uh, saying that should happen. What we find out next is that there's more mockery of Jesus. It says that the whole battalion surrounds Jesus. That would have been 100 people. Others say there's another word. It could have been, you know, 20 or 30 soldiers. And they strip him naked. So that they can put on a royal robe and a crown of thorns. And the staff is just a reed. And they kneel down and they mock him. Hail, king of the Jews. And they spit on him. And he repeatedly beat his head with that staff, that reed that they gave him. Take him back to Pilate. Evidently, perhaps from some elevated window or something, he presents Jesus to the crowd and he says, I find no basis for the charges that you have. Behold the man. Maybe he's been beaten by now. Seriously, maybe he's just been beaten up a little bit. And you can hear the crowd. They say, crucify, crucify. <laughs> Pilate says, and he can't be serious because they wouldn't allow this, crucify him yourselves. I don't find him guilty. 
And that's when they bring up their religious objection. He claims to be God's son. By our law, he has to die. Pilate questions Jesus one last time. And it is fascinating, the conversation. First of all, it says he's scared. He says to Jesus, where are you from? <laughs> and Jesus doesn't answer. He wouldn't have believed it anyway. <laughs> Pilate says, look, you're not answering me. I can, I can set you free. Or I can crucify you. And Jesus says, you wouldn't have any power unless it came to you from above. And he adds, but my accusers are more guilty than you are. The reason Pilate gives in is that the Jews trap him. Um, I've heard before that there was, that with Pilate there was a, he had had a couple of mistakes, not mistakes, but a couple of problems with the Jews beforehand with yes. riots and the zealots and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And so he was kind of, not on probation, but kind of in a spot where he couldn't really have another screw up. That's right. Couldn't have another riot, couldn't have another, have another thing that looked bad in front of the people who are above them. And so he was kind of put in a catch-22. He didn't want to kill them, kill Jesus, but he couldn't have the crowd revolt. and couldn't have, because Absolutely. he's already been Couldn't have the crowd revolt. That's right. Uh, you know, um, there's a time when Jesus is asked about the Galileans whose blood Pilate spilled. That would be an example of it. And indeed, a few years after the death of Christ, he was banished. He was taken out of office. And that's what they appeal to. These are no dummies. The Jews, or some Jews, say, if you let this man go, you are not a friend of Caesar. And by the way, that was an official title. You might get a medallion or something. It's friend of Caesar if you had been particularly good to the emperor. And they say, look, Anybody that claims to be a king is an opponent of the Caesar. Well, they have him. He knows now they could go to his superiors and claim he's not supporting Rome. He didn't get rid of this man. He hangs on to that term. He's already said, you know, do you want the king of the Jews? And now he says, here is your king. I don't know if he's trying to insult the crowd or if he's giving in to what they said. And there's still an angry crowd. Take him away, crucify him. You want me to crucify your king? And this just thickens me. We have no king but Caesar. They despise Caesar. But at this point it is to their advantage to say, we are loyal to Caesar. We're told it's Around midday, it says the sixth hour, but remember we talked about those, they use those terms very loosely. It's the middle of the day. And he does his famous washing his hands of guilt. He washes his hands from the situation. He sees he's getting nowhere. He sees that the riot he's trying to stop is, is getting worse by what he's doing. So he has someone bring out a ceremonial bowl. I wash my hands of his blood, and they say, his blood be on us and our children. We're children. Our people will take responsibility for this. And so he releases Barabbas, and in the words of Mark, he surrenders Jesus to the will of the crowd. And he hands him over to be crucified. More mocking. Or maybe it's the same kind. Strip him, scarlet robe, crown of thorns, beat him over the head, kneeling him up. It's got to be the same kind. Spitting on him, hitting him on the head. Stripping his clothes off again, the fancy clothes, putting his own clothes on him, now we're told. He carries his own cross. I was surprised to see that's barely mentioned, that he carries his own cross. Instead, 
more often than not, the emphasis is that they had to get someone else to carry it. I was reading, someone had asked. I thought a, I read that someone volunteered to carry it. No. It was an African from Cyrene, which is on the northern coast of Africa, and they compelled him to do it. Someone had written into somebody on the internet and asked, how heavy would a cross be? And they said the whole cross would have probably been 300 pounds. But that the cross beam, which is what they carried, would be 100 pounds. It has to be strong enough to hold up the weight of a person. After, well, we also don't know. Like, after getting your back muscles shredded. Yeah. We don't even know, like, what kind of cross we did. Because some of them are, like, over the edge. It's always just, like, one beam. It's just, it's just, uh, there's enough tradition. I'm okay thinking there was at least a T-shape. But, uh, no, you can't be sure of that. But he carried something. And I, I know, and I don't, I cut out stuff. And I don't know why I cut out the, the scourging of Christ. Well, I mean, it had to have been the T-shape, if he couldn't have carried 300 pounds. I don't well, know. I know that what they would do is they would put the cross together whenever they got there. Right. Well, no, I, but sometimes it was just a stake. Sometimes it was just one stake. And That's what no, yeah, 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 but and no. Sometimes there was an X in there. It with modern, with, with traditional Roman crucifixion, it was, they would have a T-shape. And so the reason why when they stabbed him, they, the water poured out of him is because his lungs filled up with fluid. And so that's from the lack of air being able to get into his lungs. And so water filled in the spaces. Yeah. No, but like, like this? But it was like for where you were. So I think you had one down there. in the wrong That's why you're told you can't put your hands over your head. Yeah. You can't breathe. You remember when we were reading about uh, Livius's site about the destruction of Jerusalem, and they said that the Roman soldiers would configure the body, that they were doing 500 crucifixions a day, and they would configure the bodies in various shapes as a, as a form of entertainment. The crucifixion hasn't happened yet. <clears throat> and I tried to find out, but no one knows. We don't even exactly know where Calvary was. Probably not the Via Dolorosa that tourists fall. But he went maybe a mile out of town. And as you probably know by now, he's going to go down a steep valley and back up a hill. That in itself is uh, cumbersome for carrying a 100-pound weight on your back. Especially after. And you've seen and read, you know how terrible scourging was. Well, also, you have to think he probably hasn't been beaten in a while. He probably hasn't. So well, no, it's been a day. Energy plus beating plus Hydration. Dehydration. Plus, there's probably, you know, the corn, the crown of thorns and like that. Lack like of blood. So, yeah, there would be a, not a fun walk. No. Mm, real bad. And in fact, his humanity shows, because at some point, evidently very early in the process, you see, it's it's kind of a parade him through town thing. Um, so shame him. But he can't carry it, evidently or else they wouldn't have compelled this stranger, Simon of Cyrene, to carry it for him. The execution process. It wasn't just for Jesus. This was execution day. There are two other robbers in the parade going to be crucified. They come to Golgotha which means place of the skull. They offer him wine mixed with myrrh, evidently kind of an anesthetic, but he refuses it. It's hard to pin down, but just for an orientation, maybe as early as nine in the morning, somewhere mid to late morning, they put him up on the cross. And as you know, he prays, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. It's, I don't know why I never pay much attention to this before, but it's been pointed out frequently in things I've read recently that our sense of modesty shaped the Renaissance site paintings we've seen of the cross. Uh, he was naked. 
That's part of the humiliation. Mm -hmm. And while he's hanging up there, three naked men dying, they're going to gamble. And pretty nice, pretty nice set of clubs here. I think we'll keep this one. Who gets it? Let's roll the dice. Now, you know, I know you've heard this before, but let's remember this method of death was meant to inhibit crime. It was a public torture so that other people would say, I don't ever want to be punished by the Romans. In addition to the horrors that we've all seen in movies of nailing to the cross, the real death is by not being able to breathe. Think about it. You're hanging this way or this way. It doesn't matter. But you're hanging with your arms. And you can't. And you're not going to be able to take a breath because you've got the weight of your body pulling against your lungs. And so you have to pull in. But to do that, you've got to pull against the nails or push against the nails on your feet. And you go through that in, in the case of Jesus, How about six hours, long about long six long hours. Long. You're bleeding. And on top of that, they're making fun of it. Pilate had no love lost for, um, for the Jews. He put a sign on the cross, as you know, that said, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. I don't think he did it to make himself look better to the Romans. I think he did it to humiliate the Jews. And he wanted everybody to know what it said. So he had it written in three languages, Aramaic, the common language of the people of that area, and Latin, the official language of Rome, and Greek, the uh, lingua franca that people use for international communications. Well, the chief priests, they got the point. They said, change it to he claimed to be king of the Jews. And Pilate, for all of his evil, must have recognized some truth here. Because he said, what I've written, I've written. It is hard for me Literally, I feel my throat closed. It's hard for me to swallow that people would make fun of Jesus while he was on the cross. One day I'm going to make myself go to that new museum downtown for about lynchings. You know about the museum downtown for lynching? Mm -hmm. And when I read the stories associated with that when it came out, it was awful. And it, there were photographs of, of crowds standing around in their nice Sunday clothes watching the lynching, okay. making fun of these people. And they so you, do it in another way now. Oh, yeah. Okay. But it's still being done. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And it's still shameful. Well, but I'm just saying that human evil didn't end in the days of Jesus, where people would hate no. somebody so much they would make fun of them in a torturous yes, situation. Still, still today. Just still different. Well, this is going faster than I thought it would. Jesus gives up the ghost, it says in the old version. And when he does, the curtain of the temple, that is the important heavy curtain that separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the building, is torn from top to bottom. There's some kind of an earthquake so that rocks split open and tombs are open. And a bunch of dead holy people are walking around and appear to many people. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to see that. <laughs> You know, I heard a report just the other day of something that's still going on in Puerto Rico. Some villages, cemetery, was the flooding just, you know, uh, destroyed the cemetery. There's nobody taking care of it. And there were broken caskets and skeletons, and they're all just been laying out ever since that hurricane. People finally decided, well, I just couldn't leave her there. We reburied Molly, you know. So the, the tombs 
are open. And there are some of those are alive now. Why do we always just skip over that part? <laughs> I know. I think yeah, there's just, there's just dead people walking again, just hundreds of them. Whatever this centurion saw, he sees the dramatic natural signs and he said, uh, he was, I think he said, a son of God. This has the son of God. I don't think he understood truly who Jesus was. I could be wrong. Still, he's lucky he'd say And there are women who stay close to the cross. And I think the fact that it mentions that the women were there implies that many of the men were not. And the most touching scene, and I, don't, I don't think I have notes on it, the most touching scene to me of all it's always been this way, is that Jesus looks down from the cross and he sees his mama and he sees his best friend. I've told you this before probably, one of the worst sights, it, not horrible, but saddest sights I ever saw was the young man that was in our congregation that was convicted of murder and went to Lakeside High School. Jeff Payne. I'll tell you the story later. Anyway, he asked me to come to the trial. His mother was a frail woman. We all knew he was going to be convicted. And I watched the parents of the victims. We all lived in the same neighborhood. And all my heart went out to them. But I watched his mother, the murderer's mother. And when they had him stand and announce that he would go to jail for the rest of his life. I saw the life just empty out of that woman, the mother of the murderer. She didn't fall, she didn't scream, but you could just see she was drained. She was drained. Jesus sees his own mother watching that. Not imprisonment. but torturous murder, execution. And so he says to his best friend, you take care of mama for me. You be a mother to him, you be a son to her. Take care of mama. Well, by this time, there have been all the mockings, assuming you got the time right, that this is six hours, but by this time, just being their breast walking by. And they just go away. Well, he is dead. The Jews want the crosses removed before the Sabbath. This obviously Friday. Yeah, it just don't look bad going to Sabbath services and you got those crosses there where all that ugly stuff happened. Can y'all take those down? Well, they have people on them. Dead people. Well, one dead person and two others. Remember, the torture is pushing yourself up and getting arrested, falling back down. Well, evidently, these other two still had a little more in them to keep trying to get breath, so they broke their legs so they couldn't push up and get their breath anymore. Their body weight would keep them from being able to draw another breath. With a hammer. Did they tell people to break their legs? No, no, no. Like the, the soldiers, legs, okay. the soldiers broke their legs okay. with some kind of weapon. Yeah, but Jesus was already dead. To make sure, they shoved a spear up his side, and body fluids, including blood, came out. There was a prophecy about the Christ that not a bone of his would be broken. And that's ironic. It was fulfilled. This is one of the times where John inserts himself into it. He said, we saw this. 
I saw that. You need to 